Well, welcome everybody. Uh, it's it's been a while. Um, in fact, I brought a prop to show how long it's been. The last time we met, if anyone wanted to join remotely, uh, they had to use one of these things. Uh, this this now holds the door to my office open, uh, and I don't even know what it's called. Um, so we certainly have come come a long way uh, in the last several months. Humanity really has had a, to overcome a lot of significant obstacles. And our work, of course, here is, is very focused, but I, I do feel it's important to acknowledge the loss and suffering that many of our communities have had uh, and recognize that it's gonna impact everyone here today and will continue to do so for the known future. Future, that's a, a concept that few to dare even to, to contemplate, let alone to try to plan for these days. But, but plan we must. Uh, it remains our responsibility to advise the governor and his administration on ways in which to help connect employers with people and people with opportunity. PC, that is pre-COVID, uh, we had high demand and, and low unemployment. And now we have this odd dichotomy for high unemployment and continued high demand. Um, sure, some are gonna blame that $600 federal payment but more than likely, it is really just a misalignment of the supply and demand. So how do we better prepare the former service sector employers, hospitality professionals, and other hard hit sectors with the surplus of existing high demand, high wage, high growth opportunities? While I'm not willing to stand here today and predict exactly how the future is going to continue to challenge our successful delivery, I know for certain that our future depends on us doing just that. So later in today's agenda, we're gonna hear a bit more about uh, the recently approved state plan. And that is the roadmap for us to follow in ensuring Vermonters have every opportunity for success in meaningful employment in partnership with the Vermont's amazing entrepreneurs and business owners. As a board, we have a lot of work ahead. Uh, and I for one am delighted that we have a partner of the caliber of the Vermont Department of Labor. Deputy Commissioner Mike Herring was given the task of navigating some of the most challenging times in the Department of Labor's history. And while I'm certain it did not feel like it during the darkest of days, Commissioner Harrington did an amazing job with the tools he had and led Vermont in supporting record numbers of Vermonters in ways that were previously unimagined. Commissioner, Thank you and your entire team for the incredible work, the tireless hours and steadfast commitment to your fellow Vermonters. So with that, it's now my pleasure to welcome Commissioner Harrington for some remarks. Uh, thank you, Adam, and, and thank you, everybody. Um, hopefully you can all hear me. Uh, I'll, I'll keep it brief. Um, you know, as, as Adam said, it's pretty unprecedented across the country. Um, at one point, uh, we reached over 100,000 uh, initial claims in uh, a very short period of time, uh, and we were uh, paying benefits to some uh, 70 to 80,000 claimants, uh, at least at one point in time. Uh, those numbers have leveled, leveled off, and I think uh, our chief economist, Matt Barowitz, will share a little bit about that information later on. But I just wanted to talk to a couple different pieces. One is, I think we all recognize that um, COVID uh, is going to be a marathon for us as a state, as it is for many other states. It's not a sprint, and we are not out of the woods. Um, not only that, but the recovery effort will likely go on for uh, an extended period of time. Similarly, um, the unemployment rate uh, will likely uh, stay high. It certainly will not stay at the level it currently is, um, but as we look at projections and modeling over time, um, we'll see a leveling off or plateau um, at a rate that will certainly be higher than um, the 2.4% uh, rate that we had experienced uh, as Adam said, uh, PC uh, prior to COVID. Um, I, I do wanna thank everybody uh, that's on the call today. I think each of you in your own respects have, have 
been challenged by the COVID crisis uh, in some way, shape, or form and have been doing a, an amazing job. Um, we, uh, the Department of Labor, would not be where we are uh, today without the support of many of you uh, and others across state government and across the state. Um, it is still a challenge and, and certainly uh, we're not claiming victory in any way. Um, we continue to uh, have claims come in on a pretty steady clip. Uh, we average about 1,500 uh, new claims a week, uh, and we are paying out roughly uh, 55,000 uh, weekly claims weekly basis. Again, that fluctuates uh, week to week, um, and that is all part of the, the ecosystem that is out there right now. Um, but certainly, um, you know, it, it's, it, we're heading down a path, I think, um, in terms of, one, having a system in place so we can manage this high volume uh, without experiencing major delays. Um, and, uh, and our team continues to work overtime and, and we are onboarding staff as quickly as we can because as many of you know, this is a natural progression uh, where we see claims come in. Um, and then uh, throughout that progression, claims also have to be processed, adjudicated, appealed, um, and there are certain pinch points uh, throughout the system. So uh, we're certainly uh, very mindful of that and, and trying to manage that as best we can. Um, and then pile on top of that the, the need, as many states have, uh, to, to quickly modernize their extremely old systems. Um, if, if it weren't for COVID, we would have held a birthday party for uh, our uh, mainframe system, which turned uh, 50 this year on June 9th uh, and is still kicking today. Um, it, you know, not only is it a COBOL system, but every system is designed to manage both the federal requirements and the unique requirements of each state. Uh, and so while we could say uh, there's plenty of COBOL programmers out there, which aren't, but even if, we, even if there were, um, each system is designed to meet the unique needs of each state. And so um, with that, uh, it is highly complex and, and certain um, workarounds and processes have been put in place over the past 50 years to get it to function a certain way. So as you can imagine, um, not only with the, the crushing load of, of COVID, but also um, with the exorbitant amount of federal requirements um, that were put in place and the idea of standing up completely new, uh, having never been implemented before programs, um, you know, those created unique challenges. I will say um, we, we, the, um, Universal, we have a tendency to look at our uh, each state uh, specific and, and in and of itself. Um, and there are certainly challenges there, but as we broaden our scope to how Vermont has fared across the country, um, we are in a much better place than many other states. Some of that has to do just by our remote nature and, and, um, and size. Uh, and that has both been from, I think we've reaped those benefits from a COVID um, perspective, from a healthcare perspective um, and health emergency perspective, but also in the U, UI world, um, it has been a much different load uh, than some of these much uh, bigger states have seen. Um, it also has made us a little more uh, nimble and flexible. Um, and so we have been able to manage that um, Unfortunately, with our size, though, comes the ability for the federal government to, to taper down the funding that is awarded to us. Um, and so while we have seen funds for standing up unique programs like PUA uh, and Pandemic Emergency Unemployment Compensation, PEUC, and uh, Federal Pandemic Unemployment Compensation, FPUC, which is the $600, uh, what we haven't seen a lot of just yet are funds um, or just the straight administering of the UI program. And so I believe to date, we've received about $1.9 million uh, in additional funding for simply administering unemployment insurance. Um, so uh, in, in this world, that doesn't go very far, um, and we're continu 
however, we have not let that slow us down. We continue to work with our federal partners on that aspect, and we do know that they are, are looking at different ways to um, disperse more administrative dollars. Um, but you have probably also seen that we are, are looking towards both our legislature as well as our congressional delegation for more support as we work to modernize our system. Um, and we won't be able to, to have a completely new system with a core pro, um, process in place by the end of the year, but I think there are opportunities for updating um, critical components of our system. Uh, that's what uh, we were looking for in our most recent request for coronavirus relief funds. Um, I, I don't want to uh, lose sight of the fact of, of the mission of this group and the board uh, and its focus on workforce development. I think um, our workforce development team, and I'll give a shout out to Sarah and her team, have been a huge partner uh, with the unemployment insurance um, load and have uh, loaned us many staff members over the past months um, to support the UI uh, program. However, uh, as we look to the future and we look to recovery, um, there are some pretty key um, efforts that have to begin uh, in order to, like Adam said, um, match up and mirror um, what the supply is and what the demand is uh, and making sure that the those job seekers and those employers that are hiring are, are linked up in a pretty seamless way. And so um, both the work of our workforce development team, but also this board, um, you know, they have a, a pretty big task ahead. Uh, and that is as we look at the recovery efforts across the state and making sure we can get honors back to work as quickly as possible. Um, I don't want to go on too long. I know we've got a lot to cover. What I will say um, is uh, in continuing, I think, a lot of the traditions that uh, past Commissioner Lindsey Curley uh, had put in place, um, I want our department to be a, a, a seamless partner with the board, um, somebody that, uh, uh, someone that can and support the efforts of the board. Um, you'll find that we are active participants, myself specifically, um, and, and here to help wherever we can. Uh, and um, you know, look forward to uh, continuing a really positive relationship and, and um, producing some really good recommendations, both on the policy, but also on the initiative side for the governor to consider uh, in our future, um, future endeavors to, to help Vermont recover. So uh, with that, um, I just want to say thank you for everybody's time uh, and uh, look forward to continuing the conversation. So thank you very much. That's great. Thank you, Commissioner. Up next, uh, we have um, what no doubt everyone is really here to, to listen to is uh, Matt Barowitz and an update on the LMI landscape. Um, so Ready to turn that over to Matt. Um, and I will try and create an opportunity for questions uh, towards the end as well. But I do want to uh, go through this data real quick. The key differences, and we'll talk a little bit about this as we, more we go along. Um, one of the big driving differences between the administrative data coming out of the unemployment insurance system, basically who's getting unemployment insurance benefits, and the Bureau of Labor Statistics criteria for being unemployed is a job search requirement. Many states, including the state of Vermont, have waived the job search requirement because of the situation associated with COVID. One of the requirements for being unemployed by the BLS definition is that you're actively looking for work. As a result, we're getting a divergence for the first time in history where we're actually getting more people provided unemployment insurance benefits than there are uh, people being counted as quote unquote unemployed, the technical definition by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. There's other factors associated that with, uh, with that as well, uh, but that is a big one, um, the work search requirement. Um, and again, it comes down to the definitions. Ultimately, these are surveys um, by the Bureau of Labor Statistics to collect information in partnership with the Census Bureau. And you're asking people really difficult questions for the first time about, are you looking for work? Are you able to work? Um, would you accept work if offered? All those questions now become extremely difficult as it relates to COVID, whether it's related to childcare, whether you or your, uh, your family is in a situation of compromised immune system, and you don't know how actually to respond to that. So our federal partners, because they wanna keep the temporal relationship of all this data, have not changed their definitions, they have not changed their survey questions. What they are trying to do is, in, um, is coach and counsel 
survey takers into better recording the information so that there's more clarity about the exact situation. But one thing we're seeing right now for the first time in the history is there are more people receiving benefits than there are people being declared unemployed. That doesn't mean the BLS data is useless or worthless. It just means you have to look at it differently and make sure you understand it before making any conclusions. So as the commissioner pointed out, it is a, a literal alphabet soup out there as it relates to programs. So the PPP, many on this uh, call are familiar with that. It relates to wage replacement for employers, the PUA, is a type of uh, pandemic unemployment assistance for people who are self-employed or people who historically have not been qualified for traditional unemployment and benefits. The FPUC the, is uh, the additional $600 rider that's going on top of the unemployed. And then the last two are more traditional in that they're related to emergency unemployment compensation and extended benefits. These are things that kick in when we start going into a recession and those are more typical. But as these programs at the top, the top three, either get reauthorized or phase out, it's going to have a tremendous impact on the data, whether that's claims or unemployment estimates. Um, but we know that that is going to um, be a driver. We're already seeing that there are changes in behaviors as it relates to employers and employees or job seekers. But it's just something to keep in mind, and we'll circle back to that towards the end as well. So with just that quick overview of just saying, you know, there's definitions at work here. And if anyone after this call wants to reach out to me and, and go a little deeper into these definitions to better understand what the data is and means, please let me know. I'd be happy to have that conversation. As I said, that's what I'm here to do is support the board. Um, I'm here to support employers. I'm here to sort, uh, support job seekers, anyone who's interested in the information. So what does the data say? We're going to dial this back bringing back the movie theme here, we'll call it claims data, a love story or a UI story. You know, looking back to week ending March 14th, 2020, this is what we were looking at. This is the world we we're going into. For context, we had one of the lowest unemployment rates in the country. It was the lowest unemployment rate that the state of Vermont had on recorded history. We were looking at initial claims, the blue line at the bottom, bouncing around, around 500 per week. And mind you, this is winter. Winter is one of our busy seasons. So 500 per week was actually quite high if you compared it to the summer of 2019 when we're doing 300, 400 a week, uh, sometimes under 300 for initial claims. And to give you a little context in how we speak, initial claims is that first week of filing someone does. After that first week, if they continue to remain on unemployment insurance benefits and continue to file, they now move into the continued claims. So the continued claims you can see um, you see it rising up, as I said, in the winter, peaking, uh, you know, 5,500 in early January and kind of bouncing around the 5,000 mark um, throughout uh, early March. Well, this is where we were, tight labor market conditions, employers clamoring for talent and uh, job seekers, um, you know, having opportunities to find employment, assuming that they didn't have other barriers outside that, which this board is well aware of the barriers associated with transportation, child care, things like that. But going into this, this is the first time where we started to see, oh my goodness, something's going on. This is when the uh, governor started taking action. You know, COVID started becoming front and center of the conversation. Initial killings spike immediately. And it's going to be important as we move through these slides to watch the scale on the left. Right now we have a scale up to 6,000 and that's covering our entire universe. While we go one more week into the future, our scale drops um, from or increases from 6,000 to 16,000 as initial claims continue to surge and spike. Um, and then they're rolling into the continued claims. So that first week initial claims now become continued claims. Initial claims continue to fuel the growth. This is where, you know, from the JAWS language, we're going to need a bigger boat. This is when the Department of Labor had to start innovating of how are we going to handle this much uh, activity. And uh, the commissioner does credit work for the Unemployment Insurance Division to find ways to support employ uh, Vermonters in this uh, tremendous uh, time of need, because this was uh, a very different situation than we'd ever uh, encountered. The scale now increases to 25,000. Our initial claims and continued claims from before start dwarfing and just looking like a straight line um, all that rich context that we had about what season it was um, completely becomes blurred as we start adding in this uh, situation. Um, this is the first time um, we started seeing initial claims go down in the middle of April. Continued claims continued to rise, um, you know, as initial claims are still very large and coming in the door. Um, 
We fast forward two weeks later, initial claims still on the decline, but now at about 5,000 per week. Again, for context, at least 10 times greater than what we're normally accustomed to. Continued claims now well over 70,000. This ultimately ends up being the peak. We see it start to come back down by um, you know, mid to late May. But again, the scale that we're at is so different. Going to where we are right now, um, no one will forget the summer of 2020 in terms, especially in the UI division, because of uh, the level of activity and commitment um, and work that it's taken to get through this much work. So where we are right now is starting to look, you know, with the context, all that history gone, you know, the last 13 weeks, you're starting to say, oh, look, you know, we, we've leveled out in initial claims. But again, comparing where we are at now for initial claims, as the commissioner said, we're still doing 2,000 a week. We're accustomed to 500 in the winter, 300 in the summer for these, uh, at least uh, in 2019, when we were in tight labor market conditions. So you see that our level of activity is still well above normal. The 40,000 continued claims, all these results in complications um, and uh, follow-up and uh, the additional work that goes into managing this. So it's been a, a Herculean effort by the UI division and uh, they have done a lot to um, uh, manage this. So when we start looking at this data, we can continue to break down the claims data. And this is when we're going to start getting away from the administrative data and start looking more towards like actually what's used for processing a survey data. Um, Caroline from uh, Vermont Works for Women will uh, recognize some of this data coming out of our uh, local area unemployment statistics promise system. But we're able to kind of look at where are the industries that continued claims are coming from. So in early or mid-March, when we talked about at the bottom, you'll see total continued claims. That's our kind of base, our universe. Total at the bottom of 5,400 back in mid-March before this really took hold. Construction represented a third of the activity in continued claims. This is because construction, uh, like a sleeping bear who's still hibernating, hadn't yet woken up for the summer construction or the spring or summer construction season. And so you see that uh, construction over time has gone down as a share as it's increased. But don't forget at the bottom, the total is growing significantly. We have um, the first three weeks of the COVID and then we start going month to month to month to our most recent. So um, manufacturing um, was coming in at 8% um, and still around 8%, but now we're talking about 8% on a base of 40,000, which is a much different number of uh, people filing unemployment insurance claims from the industry than 8% on a base of 5,000, right? Retail trade showing significant increases, representing a large uh, share of what's going on, and certainly a lot of businesses were impacted directly from the governor's um, orders to protect Vermonters. Um, I'll jump down to healthcare social assistance. A lot of people are surprised by this, but you have to think this includes, um, you know, a lot of childcare centers were closed, um, uh, dentists, chiropractors, a lot of that one-on-one -on -one, uh, medical services, and even some of the hospitals started um, consolidating their core uh, to to focus on core functions. And really, the story of the day is accommodation and food services, and that'll come to no surprise to anyone on this call. Um, those industries have been tremendously impacted by. Um, you know, uh, the reduced travel and uh, ability to move about and enjoy uh, all the opportunities that there are in Vermont. So when they were talking about 11% of, you know, basically 500 claims and accommodation food services in early March, now we're looking at a quarter of all claims, nearly 10,000 people. Uh, so we're talking about 10,000 people in accommodation and food services that are filing uh, continued unemployment insurance claims. Um, early on, when we were looking at the research of which states were most impacted and least impacted, um, that was a big line item to say, oh, states with a high concentration of accommodation and food services were states that had high impact as it relates to uh, COVID. On the reverse side, states with high concentrations of professional, scientific, and technical services had lower impacts. And you can see that that is one of those jobs that uh, people are able to do remotely and it was less of an impact for some of those industries than say retail or restaurants. So professional scientific and technical services, something this group has talked about is, you know, things that we um, I've emphasized as opportunities. We have a lower share in the state of Vermont than across the country. These are high paying jobs that can be done anywhere and uh, opportunities for individuals with uh, specialized skills to start their own business, those type of things. So um, moving forward, 
Anyone who's seen me present in the last 10 years since I've worked at labor, I love this graph because it shows what the Great Recession of 2007 looks like. Well, it is now in the books. Um, so that red line can now go to a blue line and we can start to see what the U.S. looks like as it relates to the 2020 recession, which has already been announced by the National Bureau of Economic Research. We are technically in a re uh, recession as of right now. I don't know what they're going to call this one, but uh, the greater recession is what I uh, put here. Um, it's tongue in cheek, but you can see a tremendous decline um, as it relates to the employment. This is a survey data based on employers and saying how many uh, payroll jobs they have. Um, so these are failed payroll positions, employers saying that they had a significant uh, decrease in the number of positions they had. You can see there's already been a bounce back, and this includes the most recent monthly data for the U.S., which showed, you know, the over 4 million job growth. Um, and, but again, these are just counts of jobs. They don't speak to the quality of the job. It could be people are still reduce, are working under reduced hours or reduced pay, uh, whatever the circumstances may be. This is just a count of jobs. But to give you, put it in perspective, again, similar to the UI claims data, which showed massive spikes up, this is showing um, the large decline down as it relates to employment. Mirroring the claims data in that regard is also what our survey says, where the concentration of these losses are. Um, and uh, by numbers, we're looking at accommodation and food services down 18,000 jobs, retail trade down nearly 8,000 jobs, healthcare and social assistance on 6,000 jobs. Those are the ones that are representing the largest number, year to year change, May to May. Um, this is the most recent data we have. We'll get new data uh, a week from tomorrow. We'll be able to look at June. Uh, and see how things have progressed. But just from the sheer number, these are large declines in number of employment opportunities. As a percentage, though, the story changes a little bit in that accommodation of food services is still number one. But when you put 18,000 as a percentage terms, it is, you know, startling. 56% of all jobs in accommodation and food services have been lost year to year. Um, and all of that loss has been in the last two months. Uh, arts, entertainment, recreation, looking at a third of their jobs, even though it's a smaller industry of 1,600 jobs, that is still, um, you know, a large decline in percentage terms with over a third of the jobs being gone. And construction, which we talked about as, you know, um, being ramping up for spring and summer, we're still seeing it not even to where the levels it was previously. So with 4,000 fewer jobs there, meaning a quarter of all construction jobs are, are still yet to be found in the Vermont economy. So again, this storyline of the industry is directly impacted, a lot of person-to-person -person contact, a lot of close quarters, and um, that is what is the narrative as it relates to um, the surveys from businesses. When we switch the survey to households, it's not as helpful because the definitional challenges I mentioned you know, how people answer the question, are you available to work? Are you willing to work? It gets a little squishy. Um, our claims data is so much stronger and it's so much more timely um, that it's often a lot easier to look at the claims data. So, um, you know, when we're talking about 40,000 continued claims, but our Bureau of Labor Statistics data is only showing maybe uh, 30,000 unemployed Vermonters or something like that. Um, in addition, we have a small sample size, which is limiting data on groups. I know this uh, board is interested in which, what the groups are saying. Because of our small sample size, we're not able to even get a monthly estimate of what's going on. We have to look at uh, long-term 12-month trends. But even in those 12-month trends, um, you can see the, the, the sharp rise in unemployment rates, uh, specifically uh, for uh, Black and Hispanic populations. Um, and uh, specifically men, um, black men and black Hispanic populations have seen um, a doubling in their unemployment rate uh, based on current data. And even those levels were uh, twice as high, if not higher than um, uh, white men's unemployment rate. So um, we are still monitoring and trying to get as much good data as we can, but we do know that the, the, uh, the COVID has impacted um, different populations uh, differently, and this is evidence of that as well. And the other thing with the unemployment rates is the volatility. They've been really bouncing around a bit. So even when we look at the other states around us, um, you know, Connecticut and Maine were really showing low unemployment rates for um, April and May, while other states were showing much higher, even in this close region. And we're seeing it bounce around a lot, and we're expecting some of that volatility to continue. And even if you get down from a, a more um, aggregate level of what uh, unemployment insurance rates are, look at labor force participation rates, 
things like the labor force is really jumpy right now. Um, and again, this is that concept of living data. We're really going to be looking to add more data to these estimates at the end of the year so we can true these up to better understand what the picture was. Um, but for the time being, when we're looking for timely information, we're really looking to the claims data. Now, I'm going to wrap up quickly and allow a little bit of time for questions. These last two things are very quick. Um, what has changed? And this is the question that really people ask it of me, and they don't like my answer, as is uh, common with economics and economists and how we talk. But what has changed? Prior to COVID, we had extremely low unemployment rates. And we had a very tight labor market, and we had employers that were clamoring for talent and skilled individuals. Well, many of that continues, right? So you've seen this employer's hierarchy of needs before, where the quantity demanded is larger at the lower skill, lower wages. And we know that the more skills you have, the higher wages you can command in the marketplace. And all of this still holds true. And now when we look at where the labor supply and the labor demand are, we know COVID has really impacted some of those industries, accommodation and food services, which are known for uh, lower wage uh, positions. And, um, you know, I think uh, the chair said it absolutely perfect in his opening remarks about what is it going to take to rescale? What is it going to take to get people into the, the marketplace with the skills necessary for what employers need? Because there are many employers who have not missed a beat. There are some employers who have been completely shut down, but there are the, the job postings are still out there. And if you pick up a seven days, if you look at the Department of Labor um, and what they're advertising for positions, there are employers who are trying to hire. And so it's a question of getting those people in. Again, there are some challenges as it relates to um, COVID and feeling comfortable in the workplace and childcare and things like that. But as it relates to skills and demand and skills and need, those things haven't changed. And there are still tremendous opportunities in the state. And part of our role, I see, as for the, the board is just to figure out how what going forward looks like for us. You know, I mean, I wish I knew what was going to happen. Um, going forward, there's so much uncertainty out as it relates. There, people know this old joke. Um, the uh, what do you get if you combine an elephant and a rhinoceros, elephino? Well, that's what it feels like right now, uh, certainly. And I'm going to, um, Ellen has a question. Yes, thank you, Matthew. Very, very helpful to see all these slides. <clears throat> My question is, and this may be something that Sarah also could uh, weigh in on, but, um, uh, and it speaks to that slide you had of the skills matching a couple of slides back. Um, for instance, we know that for some period of time and maybe several years, there are going to be standard jobs that have always been there. And I'm thinking in particular in the restaurant industry, uh, in hospitality, in lodging and those kinds of things that are just not going to come back because we're going to be in those, those operations are going to either be shut down or severely diminished in terms of their uh, the numbers of employees that can be working uh, with that operation still viable economically. So I'm wondering about, is there a way to use the data and is there a way within Sarah's shop to really be starting to look proactively at those parts of the workforce that we just know those jobs are never coming back and how do we proactively reach out to workers in those uh, sectors to help them get into retraining programs uh, because I think, you know, I think we're going to need to find ways of proactively doing outreach and helping them. And I'm wondering what kind of thought has been put into that thus far. Thanks. That's a great point and great question. Um, and I think there was, you know, there was active debate in the Department of Labor. When do we transition from talking about the unemployment insurance to workforce development? We've tried to make, uh, be as respectful as possible to the situation um, in the, um, the the situation on the ground. And so I will let Sarah speak to that. Um, my comment as it relates to the industries that may have difficulty returning, you know, if we're talking about accommodation and food services, we know that individuals who work those jobs come out with tremendous skill sets. They have incredible people skills, ability to multitask. Um, and so the retraining, you know, it might be helpful, but emphasizing the skills that they already have and figuring out where the transferable skills exist and how we can move forward, I think is also going to be key. So very good point. And I look forward to that conversation continuing, uh, Ellen. I'm sure you are going to want to be a part of it as well. Um, so I'm going to just um, wrapping up um, along my time going forward. 
I wanted to say much uncertainty, right? Consumer sentiment, like figuring out what's going to happen with consumers and their ability, you know, as it relates to either travel or going to restaurants, um, you know, how is this going to impact retail? That there's still much uncertainty about how this is all going to fold. Government ordinances, whether they're, you know, stay at home type orders, how that's all going to play out, which businesses are going to be successful, which ones can, um, which ones are not going to come back. Um, stimulus packages, you know, if there's a re-up of these things, are they going to be allowed to phase? How is this going to uh, impact individuals' uh, ultimate bottom line and economic well-being? And lastly, the spread of the disease, which is still unknown. I credit uh, a writer from the Atlantic for summarizing these five perfectly for me, so allow me to just grab them, um, because I've been trying to read as much as I can to figure out what the economic landscape is going to look like. And again, I get grounded in the fact that um, there is some... Um, you know, there is some history of as it relates to what they call creative destruction from a Joseph Schumpert back in the 40s. The strength of the capitalist system and the proven formula for success is innovation. And there are going to be businesses, there are going to be individuals who are going to be able to innovate and come out of this um, uh, with opportunities to make our economy hopefully more stronger, more resilient to these type of things. Um, so that idea of innovation and how do we uh, continue to promote and um, support innovation is so important. Circling back to our original poster, no answer is just terror, which gnaws at your very being. It feels like that. And as a board, we need to figure out what can we do to reduce the terror? Um, how can we get that message out there that there are employers out there, that individuals do have skills in demand um, and figure out, um, you know, if necessary to tackle the individual barriers of groups or families to help them uh, return to the workplace. Um, but the, I'll let you know, just one of the things that we're in the pipeline on is um, here's a picture of the third iteration of the Pathways to Promising Careers. Uh, we are in talks with the McClure Foundation about version four and developing that uh, and releasing it this fall. So we are excited um, about that. But again, getting that message out there, because as I talked to this board in the past, young people are particularly susceptible to negative messaging as it relates to economic outlook. And children raised during times of economic hardship tend to carry that mantra or narrative in their head longer than most and can actually impact long-term, lifelong earnings. So young people today are really getting this message that, you know, the economy shut down, businesses are closing, unemployment high. We need to emphasize the skills they have, the opportunities available, and figure out ways to um, get them engaged in their skill development and ultimately their career path. So, um, while there's still too many unknowns to predict, I welcome any thoughts, questions on the subject and insights that you might have or believe to be true about what's going to happen or where we're going. But continuing to hammer, ho hammer home the message that the skills of yesterday are the skills of today, and many of which will be the skills of tomorrow. So talking about apprenticeships, talking about, uh, you know, opportunities to work within healthcare. Um, professional business, technical services, construction, the trades, all those things, so many opportunities, and we're going to need those uh, going forward. So with that, uh, I'll just let you know we do have a, a survey on our website. If you go to vtlmi.info, if you ever want to provide feedback or communicate ideas you have about projects or just feedback on our website or our presentations, uh, there's in the upper right-hand corner of our website, you can see an opportunity to provide feedback. So we always welcome that. So I'm right at my time. Uh, I'll turn it back to the chair to moderate. I will stop sharing and give back control to. Great, thank you, Matt. Uh, so we do have a couple questions in the chat already. Uh, and then I would ask anyone else if they have a question they'd like to ask of Matt, to please uh, raise your hand through the Zoom platform and I'll, I'll continue to scroll through that as I uh, read these questions. So. Uh, Matt, if uh, you can distribute the slide deck to Sophia, who will then share that with everyone, that's been requested. Great, no problem. Another question we have uh, is, do we have data about the degree to which telework has increased? How many jobs have moved remote? That is a good question. I don't have the information on that. I did see recently that the Vermont Futures Project is starting to look at that, and I partnered with the University of Vermont Data Center to actually study people who are teleworking here in Vermont and relocated uh, due to COVID. So I'm interested to see what that work is going to uh, produce. 
Um, you know, anecdotally, my neighbor uh, is here uh, now uh, year round. He used to not be. Um, he used to only use it as a summer house, sort of. Um, so he's from Boston, and I think he's brought his partner up. So you see it around, um, but I don't have information on that. Um, I also actually can see the question from Scott Giles as well. Um, we don't have specific data by education, or actually I haven't looked at it. Um, we do have um, the breakouts, but they are such small sample sizes. I wouldn't be surprised to see that it's the same, that it's impacting people lower education um, more so, but I have not looked at that information. Um, so that's a, something I can pull together and provide to the board or uh, discuss at a next meeting as need be. Um, and let's see. So Matt, we have a, a question, uh, a comment and a, a question from uh, Janet Bombardier regarding opportunities in manufacturing. So uh, earlier we were talking about uh, the, the disproportionate amount of hospitality in service industry folks who've been, uh, who may no longer have an opportunity for work going forward. Those jobs may simply be, be gone. Um, and so a lot, of, a lot of the demand in the tourism industry is, is based geographically. Um, so in our, in our planning, I think it's gonna be important that we recognize that some people were in hospitality because those are the jobs available in the region. And then some people just for lifestyle needs went to those careers as well. So um, as someone like uh, we have over here, Chroma in the southeastern Vermont with manufacturing, how do we get this, the large proportion of people in the Route 100 corridor who continue to be unemployed, aware of, trained, and available for some of the manufacturing on the, on the Connecticut River? Uh, and that plays itself out throughout the whole state. Right. So Deanna, I don't know if you want yeah. to add to that. Yeah, well, and um, if, so this is Janet, if I could, I mean, I don't know what's happening to everybody in manufacturing, but a big trend that we're seeing is a lot of our companies we sell into because we provide more of a commodity, um, they're, they want a domestic supply chain. And so there's a lot of push to have a U.S.-based source um, for goods. So this actually creates a pretty big opportunity for some manufacturers to certainly sustain if not grow um, but now would be and and we have a, a large number of manufacturers based on work ACCD did right where you have manufacturers in a lot of rural communities that are pretty important right not just not just the chromas but um, I can think of a whole bunch of them that are pretty rural right but but are but are always looking for employees um, so I just think it's an opportunity to figure out how to make a shift between those workers into manufacturing, making sure the training's there. You know, the CCB program for production employees is great. Um, and I know Judy pushes it, you know, and it makes it really available, but um, there is some, you know, uh, it's not all bleak. Um, our demands are higher than they've ever been at Chroma. We've, we've never had to make That's so much product and I don't think we're the only ones. Yeah, and that's great. And it is a um, uh, a work environment that can, if done right, can be where people feel comfortable and safe as it relates to, to COVID-related issues. The idea that things will be onshored is a, a concept that is being discuss, uh, discussed, especially as um, international relations get a little tighter and tenser. Um, you know, I think it's going to be really important, not just with the partnerships for Department of Labor, the training institutions, um, but also the manufacturers to kind of come forward with what is in their supply chain and how can it be uh, built locally. Um, because I think uh, Janet's point is a good one that uh, things are going to be looked to be so, uh, sourced locally so that there's a little bit more control, a little bit more certainty about delivery for production because many manufacturers have not missed a beat and, and they are tremendous employment opportunities. Um, and it's always uh, something that I try and emphasize when I talk to young people. So I appreciate you bringing it up today because I did uh, kind of glean over it when we were talking about some of the other industries. So appreciate that. Okay, uh, any other comments? Let's see. Maybe, 
what we can do is hold on on your comment and question here, Tom, uh, for a broader discussion, not as specific to, to Matt's. Um, so as a reminder for anyone who's joined late, uh, please do sign into the chat, uh, indicate your attendance via the chat. Um, and up next on our agenda is uh, Secretary Curley, who is going to be giving us some updates on uh, the incredible efforts of the, of the agency uh, and the administration in the last three months and really boiled down to the last five days of, of a lot of activity. Um, so Secretary Curley, love to have you present that update. Great, thank you, Adam. Uh, it's really great to have this group back together again. And um, I wanna take a quick moment to congratulate Michael Harrington. Uh, most of you know that Michael and I work together at Labor and um, I think we made a great team and I, I think that he's done an incredible job um, through the last few months and I have had a lot of guilt because I, there were times that got really, really difficult for him and I knew that um, you know, if it weren't for the fact that I was shifted over in September, I would be in his shoes and I, I'm just incredibly proud of how uh, graceful he's been through this and how um, organized. So uh, anyway, just my moment to, to publicly congratulate Michael and say I, I'm really glad to have you uh, firmly in the cabinet. Um, I also wanted to say, you know, it's so great to uh, see Matt Barowitz. Uh, Matt's taught me a lot about data over the last few years and uh, I just, it's hard to follow Matt in a presentation, but uh, I am really glad to, to see Matt this, or hear Matt this morning. So, um, yeah, I wanted, I wanted, I know that I have to make up a little time here, but um, I wanted to share a bit about what, what sort of has gone on behind the scenes with the team at ACCD. Um, you know, as you all know, we, uh, traditionally our job is to promote economic and community development and encourage people to come to our beautiful state. And I think back to mid-March when the governor shared, you know, that we were going to go into the state of emergency and, and uh, ask people to stay home and stay safe. And literally, you know, in a, in a flash, I felt my uh, job directives turned on their head. So suddenly I was in the position of helping employers <laughs> navigate um, shutting down their in-person business functions and asking people to kindly stay away from our state for now. Uh, really, really difficult uh, for me to do. Um, I think when I first took this role, uh, I, I wasn't sure, you know, I was comfortable in my role at labor and making the change was a little bit scary and daunting and the governor's uh, words to me were, You're in, you'll be a natural at this, right? You love this state, you love to promote it, it's gonna be great. <laughs> And it, and it really it really was, and, and to be honest, as hard as it's been in the last few months, um, and, and you all know because you've all been there, there have been some really, really hard days. Um, I am glad to be able to help Vermonters navigate this. So um, we're all in it for the long haul, and I know all of us on this call, uh, we are public servants, and, uh, and this is what we do. In good times and bad, we, we help people through it. So... Just to kind of, I know you probably mostly want to really talk about the, the recovery and the relief efforts, but I want to just sort of take you back to the, to the early days quickly um, and talk a bit about, you know, the early start of the mitigation. Um, as you all know, um, by mid-March, we were asking employers to stay home, or if we were asking Vermonters to stay home and stay safe and asking employers to suspend their in-business operations. You know, there was no playbook, there was no guidebook, and um, we found ourselves thrust into this world of creating guidance to help people prioritize public health. And um, initially when we rolled this out, we asked or we, we suggested to employers that if they needed some help um, determining if they should be open or not, um, we, I'm just gonna apologize for the dog. This is like a live performance, right? Like, <laughs> We've uh, probably all been there, but uh, my dog has a chipmunk cornered and uh, he's a little wound up right now. Um, at any rate, uh, hang on just a second. Let me see if I can get some assistance from the audience here at home. Yeah, 
nobody's going to help me with this. Um, so anyway, um, our team started drafting guidance um, literally in the hours after uh, you know the governor shared to us what our where we were headed, and um, we over the the course of I don't know, 12 hours, we had probably 3,000 inquiries from people who were wondering if they should suspend their operations or continue on. So we were helping them navigate the executive order and providing guidance. And over the next weeks, we had um, created sector guidance for more than 30 sectors um, and started, you know, it got harder and harder because as, as the time went on, the questions became more difficult because not every business is the same. So while we were trying to go by sector, people definitely had some unique things about their business that, that were really difficult for us to try to figure out. But what I want to say is people really, um, as hard as this was, because I like to describe it, Vermonters are warriors, right? We go to work when we feel terrible. So um, to ask people to, to stop going to work was really, really difficult. It was difficult for the people who do just fight through and forge on. And really, you know, when I think about it, people really prioritize public health and put others first, knowing that it was going to come at a really, really great cost to their own livelihood, their dreams, and the dream, uh, the, the livelihood of their employees. So um, again, a, a lot of you are part of that, and you know a lot of people who, who really did have to um, set their their normal beside and uh, aside and, and figure out how to get through this as a team in Vermont. Um, so once we kind of got the guidance out there and we got everybody that we needed to suspended, um, our team had to start thinking about how we would reopen. What would that look like? That was, that was part of, uh, we, our team had to sort of divide up. And then we also needed to, um, we had to figure out how we were going to um, help these businesses survive. So if they were shut down, they couldn't, you know, they couldn't make money. So what were we going to do to, to make sure that when this was behind us, they had a chance of survival? So the governor uh, appointed the Economic Mitigation and Recovery Task Force. It was really a small group of people, volunteers. The goal was to literally ask them to roll up their sleeves, which they did and help us uh, draft restart guidance, um, crunch numbers, take, uh, take the intel we'd received by the impacted businesses and really try to come up with an economic relief package that would ultimately um, fill the void where the federal packages would not. And you know we couldn't have done this alone. I have to say again, I'm sorry, a lot of shout outs today, but our agency partners, um, the public partners that are on this call, the ones that are not, um, private industry, like I'm not sure we've ever had such a strong example of public and private partners coming together um, to really figure out difficult stuff. Again, no playbook here, all new for us. And, uh, you know, part of the team went on, uh, you know, if I kind of think about the, the economic recovery team, um, we broke it into three action teams. One worked on restart, one worked on financial and technical assistance, and one worked on community assistance. And the, the community or local options, I should say, uh, the local options team really has a long, um, a long runway right there. The work is to really get into the communities and see where things are going well, um, what kind of reliefs have been built within communities, use best practices, take them from one community to another. This is really a, a long-term um, commitment for, for that part of the team. The financial and technical assistance team, again, tried to help Vermont employers really navigate um, the federal programs that, that were available. We, you know, we've heard a lot about the PPP and the IDLE and um, the, the SBA and um, the Small Business Development Authority, like there was just the, our regional development corps are, we, there were so many people again that were that were involved in this and this action team again of, of, of folks who have um, expertise in lending or finance really helped us um, fill some, some voids that we had where there was so much need and um, they were, again, very critical to the success of helping people access those dollars. Um, at the same time, they knew that those dollars were not going to, 
you know, wasn't a one size fit all. So they worked with us to start um, drafting ideas of how we might help our employers with the COVID relief fund. So you may have all heard about the $1.25 billion the federal government um, allocated to the state of Vermont for relief. And, um, and our team ultimately ended up pitching a very, um, a, a very large package, a $400 million package. And I'll get into that a little bit more in a minute. Um, and before I shift gears, I want to talk a little bit about the, the third action team, last but not least, um, the team that worked to figure out how to restart our economy. So we all knew that there was no way we could just, uh, you know, flip the light switch back on and let people just go back to normal. We, we knew that there was not going to be a normal for a long time. So we had to find a way to live with this virus and to help our economy get restarted, but to continue to keep Vermonters safe. And the team, um, again, it was very small. It was about five or six people, but what they did, so we couldn't, we couldn't represent every single sector in order to keep this team nimble, but we asked them to reach out and find industry experts, which they did. And they started creating these, these phased plans, phased approaches to reopening. And these, documents were so helpful to our teams in trying to um, move forward and get the economy open um, slowly but surely. And again, hours of drafting documentation, uh, just to give you an idea of how the process worked, they would come back with this documentation. Our team at ACCD, uh, Ted and myself and, and some others would go to what we called the restart, the internal restart team, which was with health and safety. And we felt our job was to advocate for employers and really help get them open, um, help get them open in a way that they could continue to keep their employees safe, or keep Vermonters safe. And the health and safety team, of course, were prioritizing health and safety. So it was difficult. These were really hard conversations, but I feel really uh, I feel good about the process. I feel like it was in the best interest of our, all Vermonters for us to set it up this way because there were, um, it was like push and pull and we were all talking each other through it and finding ways to safely uh, reopen. And with the doctors that were on the team, uh, checking the CDC guidance and understanding the risk and understanding where the greater risk was, I feel um, like we've made some really good moves. Our governor has been very, very, uh, smart to, to he, I, I've decided there's a reason he's a great race car driver. He is steady. He's steady. And he just, um, he's calm and he looks at what the outcomes are and he's thorough and thoughtful. So again, you know, for a lot of people, they don't really know what all the, the decision making has been behind the scenes with respect to restart, but it has taken again, an incredible lift in, in, the, some of you, you know, probably on the phone, on the call here today have been involved and I thank you because um, it, it really, you know, they say it takes a village. This, this literally took a, a huge amount of, of lift to, to get this and we're still not open fully, as you know, and, you know, we're, we're anxiously awaiting um, the sort of the outcome of the 4th of July, you know, people's celebrations and whatnot. And so hopefully our numbers will stay down and we can continue to turn the spigot and get things a little more open. Um, with that, I wanna really shift and talk a bit about the relief funds. Um, as I mentioned, our teams presented a $400 million relief package. And Sophia, if you could share, um, I, I do have a slide that I want to throw up and this isn't what we ultimately landed on but it kind of gives me a, a, a base point I just realized I I also um, shared we ended up with a 400 million dollar package so I think I shared an old slide but if you look at the financial assistance um, we originally had proposed $250 million that would be a, a variety of loans and grants with many on-ramps to, to direct to all sorts of businesses, um, all kinds. Ultimately, um, what we ended up with through two bills, S-135 and H-966, was uh, $166 million, um, 
in financial assistance that came out in the form of grants, all grants. And um, of that amount, there was 152 million that was allocated to the Department of Taxes or appropriated and uh, the Agency of Commerce. So the Department of Taxes is the on-ramp for any business that collects rooms and meals taxes and sales taxes. Um, it was a really good fit because they have monthly and quarterly filings. So they have a lot of the information on file already to, to help uh, assess the loss or the impact that these businesses have had. And the Agency of Commerce and Community Development was arguably going to be covering the remainder. I'm gonna just say excluding ag, and I'll talk really quickly about that in just a minute. Um, so every other sector was coming through the agency's uh, indoor, Agency of Commerce's indoor. We uh, have, have offered grants uh, for, I don't know, since the beginning of time, but we never, uh, uh, in the past, we haven't offered grants to employers. So arguably, we didn't have the infrastructure to necessarily do what we were doing. And when we had pitched this idea originally, there were a lot of different partners that we were going to lean on to help us get the money out the door. Um, ultimately, that money came to the agency, which is fine. We're happy to have it and to be able to allocate it and, and get it into the hands of um, adversely impacted Vermont businesses. Um, but we had to build a system. So we were basically trying to, you know, build this plane while we were flying it, uh, which has been really scary. Um, and I think ultimately, uh, with the help of ADS and a, and a vendor, we, we lifted this and we were able to successfully take in applications. As with anything, um, the first, you know, Monday and Tuesday, we learned a lot. You know, we fired out some of the bugs. I'm sure we caused some frustration with some employers. We tried to manage it the best we could. And um, overall, people were very, very supportive and felt you know, fairly good about the process. So, so our team is, is um, anxious to actually get that money out the door. But you also might imagine, um, unlike the tax department, the process that happens for review um, on our side is very, uh, very hands-on, very, um, uh, what's the word? <laughs> it, it's it's uh, old fashioned looking at numbers, scrolling through pages and pages of tax documents and whatnot. And we again have a variety of people, other agencies, partners that have agreed to help us with the review pro process. So there are all hands on deck here. And, you know, again, I'll be really excited when we get that first check out the door. Um, We've offered some webinars uh, to try to help people navigate that. Uh, there's another one today. So if anybody um, is interested in, in learning more about how the application works, how the eligibility works and whatnot, I would encourage you to, to tune in at three o'clock today with our team. The information's on our website. If you know of employers who um, maybe haven't applied that, that may have suffered loss or maybe they haven't, maybe they haven't hit their worst loss yet. In fact, this, these grant funds are designed to um, provide relief to businesses who have had a, I'm going to just generally say a 50% or greater loss. The first bill was a little different, but um, if they've had that 50% a, a or greater loss between March and August, um, so some people haven't necessarily experienced their greatest loss yet, July or August might be the, the one that really shows up for them. But we want to make sure that people who need this money get into the queue and um and get some relief the the grant uh ceiling is fifty thousand dollars so uh the way it's calculated is it's um it's ten percent of the gross annual revenue so uh fifty thousand is the cap so some of these businesses that are obviously in the several million dollar range are gonna you know as a in proportion to their overall um, revenue, it's a smaller amount, but we uh, had to, to create some parameters to, to hopefully spread this out a little bit. Um, and if for any reason we find ourselves with money in August, we'll have an opportunity to sort of reset and, and look at what we um, might do to get money in the hands of, you know, more broadly in the hands of Vermont employers who have suffered this great loss. Um, in this 
relief package, again, what ultimately came out for housing, we had pitched a $50 million package. Ultimately, uh, related to housing, the package came back at about 85 million, and 36 and a half million will be administered through uh, the Department of Housing and Community Development, which is you know, in our agency. Um, this is, these are programs that are really meant to stabilize low and moderate income homeowners to prevent foreclosures, um, rehousing recovery programs for blighted and vacant properties, and rental assistance, um, broadly, you know, helping homeless, uh, you know, through AHS and a few other partners as well. Uh, so we're feeling, you know, good about the housing package. Again, you know, our concern is, is whether it will be enough, but, um, you know, we'll be hitting the ground running on a lot of that, the housing programs over the next couple of weeks. Um, AG, they ended up with uh, 30, a little over $30 million, uh, $24 million for dairy, $5 million for non-dairy, and two point five for working lands. Um, that money will all be um, uh, administered through the Agency of Agriculture. Again, they're probably a couple weeks out, but um, another great relief to the agriculture community. So, um, you know, we're, we're rolling on that. And then, um, Technical assistance, we pitched a $5 million package to help um, with sort of, you know, we know that, that employers have had to really reimagine and reinvent themselves through this crisis. And some have done it in a way that they might continue, or maybe they found something really good. I mean, Michael talked about um, the infrastructure for the UI and how we've, you know, really tried for years to upgrade that system. And yet, you know, pretty much overnight, they built an, a, a new access to the system for the pandemic unemployment assistance. And it's shown us um, that we can do it with where there's a will, there's a way. And um, so I think a lot of employers have found some unique uh, ways to deliver their service or to sell their product. Um, that they may adopt forever. Others um, really want to make sure that down the road, if we found ourselves in this position again, that they had the tools and, and the means to, again, adapt, uh, be nimble and adapt to, I you know, hope we're never in this kind of health crisis again, but whatever the crisis may be. So the technical assistance is a variety. It's helping businesses navigate this and navigate the new normal. And we ended up with uh, I think it was 2.5 million there. So a little less than, than planned, but hopefully um, with the help again, a variety of partners, we can, can help uh, employers with some technical assistance, uh, design, architecture, you name it, financial supports. And then last but not least is marketing. Um, we had proposed a $5 million package and originally, and uh, right now we're sitting on two and a half million um, and the idea is to restart and um, encourage visitation, you know, back to our state. So now we're ready to start welcoming people from what we call trusted counties. Um, and also uh, uh, encourage consumer spending, sorry, um, in Vermont as well to those uh, adversely impacted employers in our state. Um, I really do, I, I've kind of, I think, gone over my time. I want to allow for a little question and answer, um, but I just, I really, really appreciate the help. Um, so many people have reached out to our team members and offered support. Um, you're all dealing with your own challenges and navigating, and yet, again, I'm, I'm so grateful for how people have lifted each other up through this, and that doesn't mean there haven't been some really ugly moments. I'm sure you've all had some nasty emails that are written out of fear and anxiety and you have to you know look through them and try to figure out what what somebody really needs for help um, maybe they just needed to vent but you know usually there's an underlying um, ask for help so I know you've all um, had those difficult moments and days and you know again I'm I'm just I can't imagine a better team um, to work with and I'm not just talking about the team that I'm working with specifically in state government, I'm talking about all of you and, and Vermont employers broadly. It, it really, I mean, I, I am sorry we're in this, this spot, but it really has been um, uh, 
proved to me that that Vermonters are warriors and that we're going to come together in our time of need. So um, with that, I'm sorry I've, I've tried to, you know, summarize this quickly, but I would, I would welcome your questions. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, you know, as, as one in the RDC network who's worked closely with you and your team throughout this, it, it's been remarkable, the, the clearly the very long hours and long days. Uh, and, and more importantly, though, is the outcome and the, and the great product that you're able to deliver and, and turn around in such a, a short time. So congratulations and, and thank you. Thank you, Adam. I know we still have a lot of work to do, so. <laughs> We're still trying to land that plane. <laughs> um, we do have a couple questions. Uh, I'm going to be timely of our, our uh, time here. Or, and let's see, we have one from Ellen, um, who is asking uh, when you think the TA funds would be available to org supporting businesses. Um, I, I am hopeful in the next couple of weeks, to be honest, um, I'm not a hundred percent sure what the timing is of that right now. Adam, you might, do you have an idea of it? I, I hate to pitch it back to you, but um, I didn't know whether you'd been in any of the discussions about, I, I think the, um, our RFP is still being designed. Yeah, that, that's what I've heard is that okay. it's being designed and to expect it sooner than later. <laughs> We're working on it. We've, um, again, you can imagine as many hours that have been worked, and this is not an excuse, but we've, uh, we've been resource constrained and, and had to look for a little help. And once again, um, other, some folks came through. So I think we're rolling on it again, but uh, uh, look for that, I would say, inside a couple of weeks. Great. Okay. Uh, any, maybe one more question, or if we're ready, we can um, move on to our next presenter. If, um, and again, I just wanted to let folks know um, if there are questions and you want to reach out to me individually after, you know, my, I'm glad to hear from you. This is how we learn and how we adapt and adjust. Um, and uh, again, you know, just say one more time, I, another great thing about being in Vermont is that it's great when you can reach out and get the help you need. So our team, the door is open and it takes us a little bit to get through. Sometimes we send some late night emails, but um, we are learning from every, all the questions that are asked. So thank you. Thank you. So uh, we'll turn next to uh, Sarah Buxton, who is the Director of the Workforce Development for the Vermont Department of Labor. Uh, Sarah's gonna be talking a bit about the uh, state plan, as well as some of the workforce development efforts in the coming months. Welcome, Sarah. Hi, good morning. Can you hear me? You can. Yes. Great. I have a little construction going on in the background, so I'm going to use this so you don't hear the pounding or the swearing. Sorry, Lindsay, I'm going to trump you with the dog. <laughs> um, so uh, mindful of the fact that we have the governor joining us in about 20 minutes, I'm going to try to condense uh, what I was going to talk with you all about. You should have on the board website, I believe Sophia posted, a copy of, um, so I put together Vermont's workforce development vision goals and strategies that were approved in the WIOA state plan. Um, and I'm gonna return to those at the end. The first thing I did wanna cover are some of the COVID related, um, or the COVID response related matters that workforce development is working on so that the folks on this call are also aware of what's going on in workforce development in terms of our uh, response and engagement. Uh, before I go through that though, I do wanna just thank uh, um, so many of you who are on this call who've been working with us at the Department of Labor, both in supporting um, employers who are going through um, layoffs. Uh, our division works very closely with a lot of employers through our rapid response efforts. So I want to thank many of you who've helped us uh, try to support those employers who are um, executing those layoffs and also in supporting, of course, the dislocated workers um, that come with those decisions. Um, and thank you all um, also for your patience as our division, as my um, Commissioner Harrington had noted, our, our division really did have to shift uh, not only to working remotely, but also in supporting the unemployment insurance division uh, 
through this time. And so we've had to make some really painful decisions about uh, not, you know, ceasing some of our work temporarily on some of our workforce development projects while we responded to the immediate need. And we are gradually catching up and working back into some of those ongoing um, partnerships and efforts and, and projects um, that our federal programs require us to be a part of. So thank you for your patience during that. Um, so the first thing I just I want to go through is some of the services and the changes that have happened in workforce development as it relates to both employers and to uh, uh, the, the dislocated workers themselves. And if you have any questions or want to uh, be engaged further in anything that I mention, feel free just to shoot me an email, sarah.buxton at vermont.gov. Um, and I'll get you, you or other folks that you may be connected with um, uh, tied into our efforts. So the first thing that I mentioned already is that uh, our division is very busy with rapid response work. Um, there have been thousands of layoffs uh, over the past few months and one of our federal funding streams, the Dislocated Worker Program requires that we work with um, employers to support the, the legal and regulatory steps that they have to go through during those layoffs and that we provide uh, resources in conjunction with the unemployment insurance division to the dislocated workers. So uh, currently we are working through one of the largest layoffs in recent memory. Um, it's, a, it's a furlough, uh, as many of you have heard, USCIS, the immigration uh, services up in northern Vermont have announced the furlough of over 1,100 federal employees. And so we have a team of, of folks who are working with uh, employers uh, and then subsequently with the contractors that are also impacted by some of those decisions and their employees to provide um, employment and reemployment and unemployment support services uh, to those workers. And where previously, these rapid response sessions would have been uh, in-person events with staff traveling to a, a location. Uh, now we're doing a lot of this virtually. And just as has been mentioned already on this call, a lot of uh, the good that has come out of this pandemic has been um, prompting us to shift to a lot of virtual service delivery that we had been contemplating and thinking about and trying to plan for, but could no longer spend any more time in that planning stage and just had to begin to implement and we have successfully shifted many, many, many of our um, programs and services to virtual platforms and are beginning to really refine a lot of that work. So uh, the rapid response work is something that um, is required um, under WIOA. It was something that we had to talk about in our state plan, something we have to continue to plan for and staff. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that we continue to do a lot of that work. Um, Predating the pandemic, uh, we had made a very significant hire of Cindy Robillard. Uh, we created a position here at the Department of Labor called our, um, our Business uh, Services Program Manager. And Cindy had come on board and um, her uh, main charge was to look at all of our workforce development programs and the way that they impacted the employer as our customer and to um, create a plan and then implement a plan for increasing the way that we serve our employer customers. Uh, she's a phenomenal addition to our team and I'm really pleased to have her aboard. She may be joining this call uh, shortly and, and fill in any of the blanks for the other updates that I'm about to give you. Uh, but I just wanted to make sure that you're aware that Cindy Robillard is part of our team and um, it couldn't have come at a better time because the employer as our customer has been um, a significant part of what our uh, transition has, has uh, caused us to focus on in the last few months. So with that, what we did uh, starting in April was uh, create and stand up a, a business services team within workforce development. So this is a team of existing employees who are locally based um, and locally both, you know, sort of across the state, but they're working from their homes. Um, we have roughly 12 staff under Cindy's leadership um, working on business outreach in the communities. And that has translated to thousands of uh, contacts with local employers to um, help them through the rapid response and the downsizing and the shifting that they've had to um, 
they'd have to maneuver around. But more importantly, um, during this downtime, we've begun to sort of clean up our job link uh, profiles and do some proactive outreach to the uh, local employers with the jobs that are currently listed and the jobs that they are trying to hire for. And we're working to increase the quality and the quantity of our data at the um, that we have available online so that as job seekers begin to return to uh, the workplace that they have a more immediate connection uh, with good information that they can um, uh, pursue job opportunities a lot faster. So I'm pleased to say we've made a lot of progress on that. We track uh, data metrics on, on how well we're doing with that each week. Um, and we've also begun to stand up some virtual job fairs. So we've had a couple of successful ones um, in Southern Vermont, also in the St. Johnsbury area. We had a really great one in the Upper Valley. Um, one of our first was in conjunction with Central Vermont, um, the RDC in Central Vermont. So uh, we are moving toward a process of conducting virtual job fairs at least one a week and hopefully within the next, by the end of July, we'll be having uh, twice weekly virtual job fairs for job seekers to plug into and to highlight um, employers. Along with that, the business services team is actively uh, leading and uh, partnering with the governor's office and promoting the hiring uh, today VT campaign. And I'm going to do a little screen share just so you can see where on the Department of Labor's website this is. So what we're doing through social media right now is where um, we're working on highlighting different sectors or different parts of the state um, on a regular basis each week to highlight those jobs. Um, and we're trying to promote what we're, what we're framing is hashtag hiring today VT. You'll see a little bit more about that as we go. Let me just try to do um, screen save, screen share. Okay, so sorry, I, I'm also not able to, um, to share that at the moment. Sophia, can you uh, make- is the, Sarah, you are the host, so you should be able to click the little green thing on the bottom. And there should be a couple windows that pop up and you can click the one that you want everybody to see. Sure. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip this uh, just because I'm not able to do it on my end and it's probably me. So uh, what I will, uh, just let folks know is if you go to the Department of Labor's website, across the banner, you'll see a Hiring Today VT um, uh, link. And when you, when you click it, you can, um, if you're an employer, you can uh, connect with us there, brief form you can fill out. Uh, we'll have some, one of our business services team uh, members get in touch with you probably within 24 hours. Um, and we're able to, aha, thank you, Sophia. Um, so, so then you'll be able to see um, right here, yep, that middle link. You see job openings, job seeker, and employers. You can, if you're a job seeker um, and you're looking for a job, you can send us a form right now. We'll get you hooked up with a case manager um, or a career consultant. Uh, to help you navigate both available jobs and any opportunities for uh, training or resume help, um, uh, interview prep, et cetera. So uh, the last thing I'll mention for the employer side is the layoff reversion funds. Uh, we do have, as part of our dislocated worker program, um, uh, uh, some funding, and it's, uh, it's awarded not on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, that we can spend helping employers avoid layoffs. We've also worked with our federal partners to be able to interpret this as um, helping to prevent um, future layoffs. So even if you have already uh, had a layoff, and uh, for example, um, in the construction industry, we've provided a small grant and to VMEC in the manufacturing industry, we've provided a small grant to provide some um, enhanced health and safety trainings to employers so that they can maintain um, healthy and safe workspaces so as to avoid 
uh, resurgence of um, COVID cases and help them remain open. Um, we do have um, opportunities to tap into funding for those types of activities, or if there are uh, pieces of equipment that might help prevent uh, future layoffs, if there are training opportunities, reskilling as you, you look to a more virtual workspace, um, there is a lot of room for interpretation. So if you are an employer or you are working with employers um, or have friends and you, you want to sort of explore this a little bit with us, feel free to shoot me a note. I'll connect you with Cindy Robillard and we'll start a conversation about that. Um, while we're on that topic, because we did just begin a partnership with VMAC, I wanted to address something that Janet Bombardier noted earlier, and I believe, I think it was Missy from Vermont Works for Women. There have been a couple comments lately about manufacturing, and Cindy has been um, pretty active in trying to support uh, some conversations about the transformation that we may need to uh, support in the manufacturing industry specifically, um, including some expansion of apprenticeship opportunities, some infusion of um, um, some targeted training or on the job training um, funds, et cetera. And so uh, we would, we've been having these conversations at this point in time with VMEC, uh, but any employer, manufacturing employer, we would love to, to sort of bring you in and brainstorm what the Department of Labor can be doing better to um, refine the focus around the new specific emerging needs of our employers, of our manufacturing employers. Um, so I will actually make a point, Janet, you don't have to do anything or Missy, I'll just make sure that uh, Cindy loops in with you. But if there's anyone else on the call who's in manufacturing and wants to participate in some of these sector specific conversations, we, we invite your participation. So seeing that I only have uh, a few minutes left, I'll run through the what we're doing now for employees and dislocated workers. Um, so we've, we've really um, We've really moved our service delivery to virtual services. We are expecting probably within the next two to four weeks to begin to reopen our uh, offices on a limited appointment only basis. But in the meantime, we've had our, uh, our, our case managers and our staff really work on um, standing up some new tools and some new workshops and platforms for being able to deliver um, some career counseling, um, uh, some very targeted assistance to job seekers. There's some great innovations coming out of the Bennington, Rutland, Middlebury area in that in our uh, southwest region where they've created some virtual job clubs for job seekers to get on. I think it's they're using Zoom or Teams, and they're uh, they're they're basically sort of crowdsourcing support and information around specific uh, jobs, and they're you're just using it as a, a club to kind of figure out um, how these job seekers can um, uh, become more attractive to employers and connect with employers and network just a, a little bit better. So there's been some interesting platforms and some experimentation and pilots going on in that respect. Um, we've had some really great successful, uh, some very successful uh, resume support virtual sessions. Uh, and what we're finding in this is that we have some staff who are really talented in being able to help support um, in um, resumes or maybe they're, they're uh, some are a little bit better in doing interview prep, and now it no longer matters if that staff person is located in Newport or St. Albans or in Springfield. Um, if there's a specialized need and we have someone who's, you know, really good at working um, virtually with someone on improving their resume, um, we can just connect them regardless of the region that they're um, they're in. And by the way, you'll know I just said the word regardless and not irregardless. If any of you noticed, irregardless is now in the dictionary. That's, uh, that's very d upsetting to me today. But regardless of where you are located, <laughs> uh, we, we are figuring out that we can redeploy our staff um, very differently. We hope to continue that going into the future. Uh, the last thing I want to preview for you in terms of the dislocated worker or job seeker services, in addition to um, uh, really putting a lot of work into um, uh, increasing the quantity and the quality of job postings on our, our job board, um, is that we're, we've uh, piloted already a, a six-part workshop series, a virtual workshop series called The Future of Work up in the Northeast Kingdom. And that actually had been, it started to pilot um, this workshop series before uh, the pandemic, and now we've begun to roll this out 
to the, the various regions and asked for our staff to contribute to enhancing the number of workshops that would be available both online. So this would be um, some YouTube videos, some uh, what we're calling the VDAL Minute, you know, sort of minute, um, almost uh, podcast-like tips and tricks for, for uh, staying relevant when you're at home and you're unemployed, you know, things that you can be doing to um, other tips and tricks that have come um, through years of experience or our, with our staff and our partner staff around um, uh, preparing for an interview, how to have a, uh, I think we're, we're working on one that is interviewing online. Um, so the virtual interview is very different from an in-person interview. So we've got this uh, six part, the future of work uh, workshop series that will probably be uh, posted and broadcasting a little bit more fully within the next four to maybe four weeks or so, but it is currently being uh, piloted. Um, okay, so with the last few minutes that I have, I'll just let you know about a few of the other projects that we're working on in conjunction with many of you who are partners here on the board. We're working with VSAC on launching um, um, a, a a, a scholarship opportunity for Vermont high school graduates to enroll in a C an adult CTE program across the state. So uh, look for some information about that. We're hoping to make this uh, a grant opportunity that works in conjunction with the advancement grant to help support individuals who, whether they're recent high school graduates or they're dislocated workers um, who are facing a new a career shift, we're looking to try to steer them in the direction of the CTE centers and uh, promote some enrollment there and some nice layering of funding that would complement the uh, the advance grant. We're working um, with the Burlington Tech Center on a solar installer training program that's specific for new Americans, um, working to try to hit a, a lot of our similar, uh, a lot of our, our shared aims around supporting the new American population and um, some of the um, energy uh, aims that Tom Longstreth had just uh, noted in the chat a little bit earlier. Um, where we provided a grant just last week um, and are starting a new partnership with VASI, the Vermont Association for the Education of Young Children, around scholarship and mentor, apprenticeship mentor training for um, early childhood um, child care workers. And uh, one interesting component of this is building on some pipeline development work that had uh, existed or had begun last year with the Child Development Division and some local CTE centers and trying to build from high school into uh, um, a career, some, some pipelines in the early child care sector. Uh, right. We've got some manufacturing programs that are um, will be supported with CV, uh, uh, CCV and VTC. And actually I see right now that the governor has joined us. So I'm going to uh, suspend the rest of my uh, report out for the next meeting. Great, thank you, Sarah. Uh, so yes, uh, with um, a bit of a summary here, uh, Governor Scott has joined us. Governor, uh, you've had several of your administration speak here today. Um, what, is, what is clear for everyone who's heard those folks present is, is that under your leadership, the administration, the state of Vermont has responded, uh, but really gone above and beyond with, with many of those individuals working tirelessly seven days a week to produce results. You know, sometimes we can all just pedal faster and, and really go nowhere. Uh, but what we see here, what we heard here today is that that, that pedaling uh, has produced some great results. So uh, welcome to the State Workforce Development Board and um, the, the table is yours. Well, thank you very much, Adam, and, and good morning uh, to everyone. And I appreciate everyone being here today. Uh, you mentioned about having uh, some of our team members there today. Uh, I, this is like one ex expansive uh, team uh, that we have and, uh, and I appreciate all you're doing uh, as well. And I know you're doing your very best uh, to get through these challenging times like every one of us. And I thank you for that. But I hope your, your families uh, are healthy and you uh, are taking some time uh, to enjoy the summer as well as we slowly and safely uh, open up our economy. Uh, as you know, uh, not long ago, our unemployment rate was one of the lowest in the country. We're the envy uh, of the country in some respects. 
and Vermont's future depended on keeping and attracting more workers for the great jobs we had available, which would also help uh, bring more families here uh, to fill our schools and help grow our economy. Uh, the reality is our demographic challenges are still here today, but as policymakers, uh, we had to uh, focus on our more immediate needs. So early in the emergency, uh, where we saw tens of thousands of Vermonters suddenly unemployed, uh, we were overwhelmed with the magnitude of the problem and had to figure out ways to deliver unemployment benefits to folks uh, who were desperately in need. We also uh, had some other challenges. We had to create uh, uh, new systems to deliver the PUA, uh, the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance, and work around major issues uh, with our, our, our antiquated UI system uh, to make sure that we got the checks out the door as quickly as possible. Uh, it was a difficult time um, for not only us, but state government across the country. The volume, the sheer volume of unemployment claims was unprecedented, and the need for those benefits was immediate. So in order to help, uh, we faced those challenges head on and uh, decided uh, that we needed to put people over policy. Uh, I'll be the first to say, you know, our response wasn't perfect. Uh, there was no playbook. Uh, but when we look around the nation, we got money out of the door out the door uh, faster than most. Uh, we took an all hands on deck approach uh, with agencies and departments from across state government coming together to help. This extended team was able to solve problems quickly and efficiently, uh, guided by the well being uh, of Vermonters, uh, not the, the typical cumbersome government policy and procedure. I'm also thankful for the work of, uh, of our team at the Agency of Commerce and, and Community Development, led, led by uh, Secretary Curley. From the very start of this emergency, uh, they've worked with businesses on the ground that, through no fault of their own, were forced to shut down. And as we've started to turn that spigot and open things back up, uh, they've been able to provide much needed economic relief. I can tell you this. Uh, had someone told me just six months ago that I'd be the governor shutting down businesses and telling travelers from other states to stay home, I would have told them they were crazy. Not in a million years did I think we'd have to cancel, shut down portions of, of state government, cancel schools, or even, even ask for modern, uh, to stay home to simply stay safe. But those were the tough calls we had to make based on science and data for the health and safety uh, of all Vermonters. Uh, above all, I'm grateful uh, for the support of the people of Vermont, for their understanding and cooperation as their daily lives change drastically, and their, for their resilience as we move to further reopen and recover. That's the type of attitude and effort we'll need from each one of you as we forge a uh, path forward. The work of this uh, state Workforce Development Board and our workforce system as a whole might look a little different than we planned just a few months ago. But making sure that every Vermonter has a path to meaningful employment and the training to grow and progress in lifelong careers and supporting employers and attracting talent and growing their businesses remains a top priority of, of me and my administration. And I know it does to you as well. So as we adapt to this new environment, uh, it's encouraging uh, to see all of you here and to have this talented group of Vermonters working on these important issues. Your expertise uh, with a wide range of real world and perspective are, is going to be crucial as we move forward uh, to build better futures for all Vermonters. Our work days may look a little different than before. Uh, we may have more virtual meetings like this than, than we ever thought we'd have more conference calls, email exchanges, but I know we're all doing our best to adapt to reality. And as I said from the beginning of the crisis, we'll get through this, but we're going to have to do it together in order to be successful. So I, I thank each and every one of you for doing your part. I thank you for taking the time today to get together. And, uh, and I look forward uh, to working with you in the future on how do we get Vermont back on track uh, because we have, you know, we have so much uh, to offer here, and uh, it's just how we leverage that and how do we prioritize? Because because getting people back to work in a safe way 
uh, is it's going to be vital uh, to our success uh, as a as a state as a country. So, again, I uh, I thank each and every one of you for uh, for taking part in this. Great, thank you for joining us today, Governor. So uh, we did have a couple other items today um, in today's agenda uh, as far as uh, conversation. So we had some questions that were posed earlier. Um, if anyone has a question that has not yet been addressed, uh, please do either raise your hand uh, virtually or post that in the chat box. Governor, would you like to field any questions directly? If, if anyone has a, a question for me, I'd be happy to try and answer it, or I have uh, some of my, my teammates here who might be able to have the answer as well. Okay, great. Although I've been answering questions, you know, thrice weekly, two hour sessions, six <laughs> hours a week. Uh, it's been, uh, you know, that's been unprecedented as well. Uh, it's been remarkable in some respects, but it's been good, I will say, uh, to get. Uh, folks from outside of the beltway, so to speak, outside of Montpelier, uh, from, from small papers and, and uh, media sources throughout Vermont to call in uh, has been uh, really interesting. Uh, and, uh, and it shows the diversity of Vermont. But we don't usually get, you know, typically we have the press conferences in the, uh, in the state house or here on the fifth floor. And uh, it's all of the usual suspects that come about, you know, six, eight, uh, of the, the larger media sources and uh, you know it's, it's really opened up the door to, uh, to hearing from other other folks from you know Ben Cabana, uh, proud of our reformer, uh, some of the, the Northeast Kingdom and so forth and the Caledonia record. But we never we never get them at a normal press conference. So again, the silver lining of this has been expanding in some respects the communications that we have and hearing. Uh, what people are thinking outside of Montpelier. So that's a challenge to the group. Uh, anyone have a question that has not yet been asked of the governor? <laughs> uh, Pat, I see you started to type a question. Um, do you do you have it, it? Didn't come through. Pat, you're on mute. Two steps. <laughs> Governor, I just wanted to thank you for being so approachable, um, and especially on a remote platform, the virtual platform. And related to that, your commitment to really work on the broadband issues. Um, we work particularly with mature workers. Um, they are perfectly adaptable to being able to work at home if we can get, we are currently doing the training to let them know how to work on virtual platforms and trying to enhance their technology skills to be able to use the media that's available. But now what we need is the broadband uh, reach to be expanded throughout Vermont. So again, thank you so much. Yeah, you know, we knew, uh, I think all of us knew how important broadband was uh, before the pandemic, uh, but this has really uh, escalated and highlighted just how important it is in this environment. And uh, I, uh, I know we'll be able to take some of the CARES money. Uh, it won't be enough uh, to do everything that we need, but it'll be a start and we're working on some other approaches as well. I'm really hopeful uh, that the federal government will take this initiative and make it like an REA type of approach, uh, the Rural Electrification Act, and, and turn it into something much bigger. Uh, because I, we're not alone in this. Throughout the, throughout the country, uh, we have areas that uh, are underserved or not served at all, and we have that in Vermont. So um, we're going to need some help, federal help, in order to accomplish this, because it's, it's not just $10, $20 million. It's hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars that we'll need in order to get uh, this to uh, to a uh, point where it's uh, it's as easy to use as you know flipping a, a light switch at your home. Um, so I'm uh, I'm hopeful. I've talked with our, our congressional delegation extensively about this, uh, Senator Leahy and uh, uh, Congressman Welch in particular, and they. Um, understand the need uh, as well. And, and hopefully that'll be one of the, the packages in the future uh, that we can really make a dent in this. Okay. 
Okay, well, Governor Scott, I know you have a, a tight agenda today. So again, thank you for joining. It looks like we have no other immediate questions. I think we have, a, we have another meeting. All my meetings are just back to back to back and all by, uh, by video conference, which has been, you know, I've had to up my game a bit in trying to figure out how to use all the different forums, but it's been, been good for me as well. Great, well, thank you again. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. See you all later. Okay, so um, we're, we're just about out of time. Sarah, did you want to wrap up a few of your, your comments from uh, when the governor was joining us? Um, sure. The only other things I want to make sure folks know are on the radar is that we're doing, um, I mentioned there are a couple of sectors that we're really trying limited money, but we're trying to really focus on. One is, I mentioned um, childcare. The other is healthcare. We're working, um, I think at a previous board meeting, we talked about a partnership between CCV and VDAL and Brattleboro Memorial Hospital. We're trying to replicate that in other parts of the state. I think some of the board members at the time wanted to know if we were gonna go into the Northeast Kingdom. We're able to put a little bit of money aside to um, work on doing that, both with hospitals in St. Johnsbury and Newport. Um, VTC is partnering with us on an LPN program um, with Central Vermont Medical Center. So we are trying to address the healthcare workforce, um, working on a manufacturing um, apprenticeship uh, program just as a component of some support for the, the, trans, the transformations happening in uh, the manufacturing sector. Um, there's a partnership that we're also trying to promote. Um, we had you know, a year ago really talked about relocation and how that was gonna be a big emphasis, the work here in the Vermont Department of Labor. We've backed off that a little bit because dislocated worker support is important. However, we are still um, needing to um, create that infrastructure and that framework. So we're, we're gonna be partnering with BDCC, um, Adam's team and uh, folks in Bennington County to um, look at some community partnerships and some systematic changes that we can make in expanding the way we work together and helping individuals who wanna to relocate to the state have all the resources they need. Um, as Pat, you all, hello Pat, oh, we, we expanded a little bit of support for the Mature Workers Program because, um, uh, because of the COVID crisis and, and the way that um, that's unfolding for mature workers. So. Um, look for some more uh, resources that could be coming available through workshops through Vermont Associates for Training and Development. And then um, two other ones I just wanted to mention. One was ongoing support for pilot up in Franklin and Grand Isle around restorative justice and individuals coming out of the correction system. So some folks in this um, on this board have, have been advising the Department of Corrections and some of the second chance grant work and so we appreciate that. We just want to know that we're complementing some of that with um, this pilot up in Franklin and Grand Isle uh, uh, counties. And lastly, we are working with uh, Resource Vermont, VYCC, and Vermont Works for Women on painting some more barns that um, you'll, if you go to the Agency of Agriculture's website, um, you'll see an application if you know someone with a, a giant barn that needs to be painted. Uh, we're going to go and try to try to get maybe two barns and, and uh, build this out as a youth um, or young adult uh, work program over this summer and the next spring in partnership with, with the three organizations I just noted. So we're very grateful to those three organizations for, um, you know, continuing to partner to get some work done to beautify our landscape, but also to provide some opportunities for um, more rural uh, younger workers to start gaining some valuable skills and getting into the workplace and hopefully transitioning them to, to further employment. So I just wanted to make folks of, aware of that, um, of all of that work. And I know we didn't get to the WIOA state plan. I'm sure you're all really disappointed. Um, but um, I please do at least review the, the goals and the strategies. And maybe at a subsequent meeting, I can send some follow-up notes about what um, the core partners are looking to do in terms of implementing that plan over the next four years. So we do have four years um, to um, complete all of the work outlined in the in the plan, and we'll we'll get to all of it. Thank you, Adam. 
Great, thanks, Sarah. Um, so I do want to give a little uh, little light to Tom's comments and, and question regarding uh, the ability for or the potential for a state or a federal uh, work program tied to housing, environmental uh, change, cleanup, and a low carbon shift along with high speed internet. Um, also saw a comment regarding uh, childcare. Uh, so is that being a real, a real barrier to uh, women transitioning from uh, some of the service industry positions to more the manufacturing. Um, so we, we definitely have opportunities. We have continued challenges uh, and am thankful that we have folks on the, on the call today and those not able to join us to come together for this. So Sarah mentioned the, the state plan. Um, really want to encourage everyone and before our next gathering, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll ask everybody to review that again um, and really look forward for ways to help connect those unemployed folks with, with high wage, high growth, uh, high demand opportunities that exist in the state um, and identify what those barriers are to getting people into those, those new positions. Uh, it is our opportunity, it is a necessity, and it really is our future. Um, and obviously everybody on today's call uh, is a believer in that and a participant in helping make that happen. Um, before we adjourn, uh, I want to make sure we have opportunity for any questions not yet posed. Um, please, by raising your hand uh, through Zoom or typing into the chat, please do let me know if anyone has any further comments or questions. And we'll do the awkward Zoom prolonged pause. Okay, great. Jay, uh, can you come live? Where are you, Jay? There's Jay. The floor is yours, Jay. Thank you. Um, so I just want to introduce the members of the board to our new state CTE director, uh, Ruth Durkee, as on the call, or she was, and she joined us in April. Um, and I have been promoted to an, the assistant director of the Student Pathways Division. So I'll still be working with Ruth as the CTE director. Ruth, are you still here? Looking for Ruth. <laughs> I don't see I don't her. think she's on anymore. Okay. Okay. So just a little bit about Ruth, if, if I may. Um, Ruth has worked in career in technical education in Vermont for the last 20 years in adult ed and um, at the Randolph Technical Career Center and uh, working with students on dual enrollment and, and other things at the Central Vermont Career Center. And Ruth is an attorney by um, training and um, she's already on the ground running. The first thing we had her do when she started was to proofread the state Perkins plan. And so she's very familiar with with that plan, which um, also was approved by the Department of Education uh, a month and a half ago. So we'll have her join the calls. Excellent, great. Well, uh, glad to have that update and glad to have uh, you having another teammate there ready to go. Yeah. Uh, we have one other question and, and maybe we'll wrap it up with this. Uh, I don't know who this would go to. I guess we're going to go to Sarah with this. Uh, will the COVID-19 situation change the funding approval for Vermont WIOA state plan? I'm pleased to let you know that um, it was a tight uh, sprint to the finish line, but we were able to get it approved without any contingencies. Um, so it was approved as of July 1. And um, yeah, we're good to go. We, we had a bit of back and forth for a little while on some of our programs. Um, I'll, I guess the last thing I'll, I'll note is that they really wanted us to um, describe more in the state plan how we're supporting veterans. So we did. And now in the course of the next few years, uh, we'll be working to really promote more uh, veteran outreach and priority of service to veterans through all of the workforce development programs. So uh, we have the thumbs up. We're good to go. 
We've got four years. Thank you for all your help. The, the, uh, the plan really was informed a lot by many of you in the, on this, um, this call. And so I, I hope that as you review the plan, you'll see your comments reflected. Okay, uh, Dustin or Sophia, uh, any closing comments? Uh, none on my end. I'd just like to thank everybody for bearing with us through the last three months. Um, you know, when we finally were able to reconnect with Adam, um, you know, the kind of the, the work of the board and, and workforce development as a whole, just like labor, uh, you know, it, it kind of fell to the wayside as we were dealing with unemployment uh, and, and the real kind of immediate needs of the emergency. So I'm uh, very happy to be back in a place where we can get together and start talking about how we're going to uh, move forward and what that looks like. Uh, and, you know, excited to, uh, to not be buried under uh, a mountain of, of uh, really important work that, that, uh, that we had to get through. And I think we got through as well as we could. So um, appreciate the opportunity to be back and look forward to hearing from everybody. Okay, great. With that, I think uh, I will look for a motion to adjourn. I'll move. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Aye. Aye. The ayes have it. Uh, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Uh, look forward to some more communication in the coming weeks.